Hi everybody, Jacob Reed here from ReviewWeekon.com. Today we're going to be talking about the money market. If after watching this video you still need a little more help, head over to ReviewWeekon.com and pick up the Total Review Booklet. It has everything you need to know to ace your microeconomics and macroeconomics exam. Let's get into the content. So the money market is like any other market. It's got a supply curve and a demand curve. And we're going to start off by talking about the demand curve. And when we talk about the demand for money, we're talking about people choosing to hold their wealth as money. And that leads us to two components of the demand for money. The first component is the asset demand for money. The asset demand for money comes from people choosing to hold their wealth as money, as opposed to other types of assets. Essentially, people have a choice when it comes to their wealth. They can either hold their wealth as interest-bearing assets like certificates of deposit, money market mutual funds, or treasury bonds. But people can also choose to hold their wealth as cash or money. And when they choose to hold their wealth as money, they are demanding money. If we graph out the demand for money on the x-axis, we are going to have the quantity of money. And on the y-axis, we have the nominal interest rate. You can either write nominal interest rate or abbreviate it as little i. The asset demand for money is a downward sloping demand for money curve. And that's because the nominal interest rate is the opportunity cost for people choosing to hold their wealth as money. If I hold my wealth as cash, that means I'm not earning the interest I could have earned if I put my wealth in a certificate of deposit or some other interest-bearing asset. And so when interest rates are low, people are going to choose to hold more of their wealth as money. And that's because money is the most liquid form of wealth. And given the low interest rate, people will have a liquidity preference and choose to hold more of their wealth as money as a result. But when interest rates rise, the opportunity cost for holding your wealth as money also rises and people will demand less money as a result. But when interest rates fall, people will again demand a higher quantity of money. The second component of the demand for money is the transaction demand for money. The transaction demand for money comes from all the money that people need in order to process the transactions within our economy. All of the transactions within our economy are measured by the output expenditure formula for GDP. That means if any of the components C, I, G, or X change, that will change our transaction demand for money. But in addition to all the goods and services that are bought within our economy, we also need to factor in the price level. Because when things cost more, it will take more dollars to process the transactions for those products. And when price levels are lower, it will take less money to buy the same goods and services. And finally, we have expected inflation. When people expect more inflation, they demand more money. And when they expect less inflation, they'll demand less money. If we go ahead and add together the asset demand for money with the transaction demand for money, it will give us a downward sloping demand for money curve. And it looks like most other demand curves you've already learned about in this class. And just like other demand curves you've learned about in this class, a rightward shift is going to be an increase in the money demand. And that can come from an increase of any component within the output expenditure formula for GDP. An increase in the price level, inflation expectations, or a desire for people to hold their wealth as money will also increase demand for money. Also, like other demand curves you've learned about, a leftward shift is going to be a decrease. And that can come from a decrease in any component of GDP, the price level, inflation expectations, or people's desire to hold their wealth as money. Next, we're going to talk about the money supply. The money supply is determined by actions of the central bank, primarily a central bank when there are scarce reserves, and changes of banking lending within the banking system. And actions of the central bank will impact how much money banks have available to loan out. And since the supply of money is primarily controlled by actions of the central bank, there will be no relationship between the quantity of money supplied and the interest rate. That gives us a vertical supply of money curve because at any interest rate, the money supply will be fixed. And just like other supply curves you've learned about in this class, a rightward shift is going to be an increase. If there's an increase in the amount of lending in the banking system, or there's expansionary monetary policy that you'll learn about in a future video, that will increase the supply of money, shifting it to the right. And like other supply curves, a leftward shift is going to be a decrease in the money supply. That can come from a decrease in lending within the banking system, or contractionary monetary policy, which you'll again learn about in a future video. When we graph the money supply and money demand curve on the same graph, we can find the equilibrium nominal interest rate. If the interest rate is greater than the intersection between the money demand and money supply curve, then the quantity demanded of money will be less than the quantity supplied. 
that surplus of money will push interest rates towards the intersection where we reach the equilibrium nominal interest rate. And if the interest rate is below the intersection, then the quantity demanded is going to be greater than the quantity supplied. That shortage of money within the money market will increase the interest rate towards the equilibrium nominal interest rate. If we see a shift in the supply curve, that's going to shift the nominal interest rate. An increase in the supply of money, primarily from actions of the central bank with a scarce reserve system, will decrease the nominal interest rate within the banking system. And if there's a decrease in the money supply through contractionary actions of the central bank, that is going to increase the equilibrium nominal interest rate. If on the other hand we have demand curve shifts and there's an increase in the transaction demand for money, that will increase the overall demand for money, causing the nominal interest rate to increase. And if people choose to hold more of their wealth in interest-bearing assets instead of money, then we are going to see a decrease in the demand for money, and that will lead to a decrease in the nominal interest rate. When we see lower interest rates within the economy, that lower interest rate is going to lead to more gross investment because businesses are generally borrowing money when they purchase physical capital. And when interest rates are lower, it is cheaper to purchase that physical capital because they are paying less interest on those loans. So when that interest rate lowers, there's more gross investment. That greater amount of gross investment means more physical capital stock within the economy. And more capital formation means greater rates of economic growth. So that production possibilities curve shifts outward more quickly and the long run aggregate supply curve shifts to the right more quickly. And if we have higher interest rates, that's going to mean less gross investment because it will be more expensive for businesses to borrow and purchase physical capital. That lower amount of gross investment means less capital. Less capital formation means slower rates of economic growth. And the LRAS and PPC shift outward more slowly. And there you have it. That is the basics of what you need to know for the money market graph. Now make sure you watch the monetary policy video to see how actions of the central bank with a scarce reserves banking system can move that money supply and change that interest rate to close an inflationary gap or recessionary gap. But if you're ready to practice, head over to reviewecon.com and play the money market game. And if you still need more help after that, pick up the total review booklet. It has everything you need to know to ace your microeconomics or macroeconomics exam. That's it for now. I'll see y'all next time.